Well, good morning, everyone. Everybody's mic on. Okay, the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Yes, good morning. Uh, okay, thank you, Connor. Good morning. Um, just a couple of scheduling, upcoming scheduling announcements. Um, April 11th, we are having our second advisory, general advisory committee meeting of the year that will be held um, in the pavilion, I believe, where we'll update our website. We'll, we'll have it here um, from 10 to 12 that day. And then we are going on the road up to St. Johnsbury and the community up there to uh, listen and learn uh, about what they're doing in healthcare. And uh, that is on April 18th. We'll be up there the full day. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of March 14th and March 21st. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. We've moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 14th and Wednesday, March 21st without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Um, at this point, um, Todd will welcome you up. Thank you. All right, my first meeting in the new digs here, so. Do my best to try to read your face. Well, you're dark, so I can't read your faces over there, but I'll do my best. So for the record, Todd Moore, CEO of One Care Vermont. But we could put on a play up here, so maybe when Ham Davis finally finishes his book about this pe period of health reform, we can turn it into a play and do it all together. <laughs> we can all play ourselves. We can play ourselves. But. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I know the topic at hand is, is hospital budget guidance uh, for uh, 20, fiscal year 2019, and, and that's really going to be the uh, nature of my remarks. I, I'm here, you know, truly wearing the hat as uh, uh, an all-payer model, risk-bearing ACO, uh, and my thoughts on, uh, on that today. Okay, I couldn't resist yesterday. I dropped in a slide. It took me a while to go back and find this presentation uh, from almost five years ago to the uh, Accounting Reimbursement and Cost Committee of, of VAS, um, which has all the CFOs of all the hospitals on it. Uh, and we were talking about where this could go. This is right after we had crossed over into under the SIM grant having uh, upside only uh, shared savings programs for Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Vermont's qualified health plans uh, for, its, for their first year of 2014 and Medicaid uh, in addition to our, our Medicare program. Uh, and at that point, I, I sort of predicted that in the future, the Green Mountain Care Board would have a third dial uh, in the middle, uh, which was the ACO uh, economics. Uh, and, you know, really, that's where we are today. And I remember uh, during that meeting, uh, and I just took that from some sort of clip art that had three dials on it and put words around it. But I remember saying at the time, you know, the biggest risk for us is will the Green Mountain Care Board, you know, not succumb to the temptation to set those dials at different numbers, meaning you know they try to artificially have lower uh, uh, insurance rates, but want the hospitals to get more resources to uh, do what they need to do to keep services uh, uh, aligned. And you can't give an ACO a higher target than the insurance rates can bear, uh, or put me in a position that that uh, it's out of line with the hospital budgets, which is two thirds of the spend in, in the ACO world. So I, I think the future has arrived. I think that's exactly where we are this first cycle year to year uh, within the all pair model uh, a world. Uh, you know, we got through last year a uh, inaugural budget submission from from uh, one care to get us uh, uh, off the ground. Now we're into sort of the the first year of what will be a steady state of these three these three dials. And, uh, um, you know, I guess I, I thought five years ago it was going to be challenging for everybody uh, to try to think about this. And uh, I think the, the reality is is that. Okay, so a little bit more context. I guess my first first reason I, I uh, am glad to be invited here is is the ACO's interest in having those dials uh, aligned. Um, they do relate in very direct ways to each other, uh, as well as indirect ways, uh, and. Um, 
you know, it's more avoiding misalignment than it is that there's a right answer for how to align them, uh, you know, and parameters set in one of the dials um, as seemingly sound could jeopardize both short term or long term uh, setting sound parameters and avoiding uh, unintended consequences uh, in the other. Uh, and from an ACO perspective, my biggest unintended consequence I'm trying to prevent is that the hospitals can no longer afford uh, or uh, uh, be desirous to be in the all pair model uh, and the ACO model. Um, you know, from an ACO under all payer model perspective, we believe the 3.5% growth target is sound. Um, it was developed to be an appropriate target for a sustainable, smoothly implemented affordability and to be sort of the discipline in the system of uh, keeping uh, excess costs uh, in check. Uh, obviously, moving up with scale targets over time means more and more of the system is in that. And I know you as a board in these early years need to you know, really make sure the rest of the system isn't where uh, things burn uh, too hot uh, outside of the risk bearing programs. But I think the 3.5% is, is a good number. And certainly in these early years of all pair model, you know, I'd prefer that to be a big anchor number until we prove that it's overly generous and then maybe years three of five would be the place where we might uh, turn that back down uh, if, uh, uh, if things are going well. And then finally, that third risk point here, the recognition that our risk contracts with the hospitals are, are new, and, new and fragile. Uh, and it is fair to say that this transformation is, is being done on the backs of the hospitals uh, and, and their revenues and, and balance sheets. Um, you know, I, I would probably have different perspective on that if the delivery system reform uh, 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 that was available under the 1115 waiver renewal of $210 million across five years uh, was available to offset some of the costs and help mitigate some of the risks in the early years. But the truth of the matter is we're doing this with some help from the agency human services, some help from uh, the federal government, but mostly on the backs of the hospitals uh, to invest in primary care payment reform for the community. Um, programs to bring in designated agencies and home health and triple A's, uh, infrastructure for the informatics and the clinical transformation support uh, out of one care. Uh, and on top of all of that, bear risk on the total cost of care. They're really the risk bearing entities. And uh, you know, one of the things that you gotta realize is that the one care budget and the hospital budgets during this part of the early all pair model assume even risk performance, meaning there's no savings or losses that we're going to exactly meet the risk targets. And, and in that that's probably unlikely we're going to be right dead on. You know, that's something you got to think about is, is uh, put that in the context of these budgets is, is turning the, the delivery system into a risk bearing system, really with the hospitals being the risk bearing entities. Okay, so with that, I'm just going to be pretty uh, punchy here with what my recommendations are. Uh, and these are recommendations to the board. I understand you're standing to, to make these decisions and balance uh, uh, multiple points of view. Uh, first is, is please consider that the all payer model and the one care contracts uh, for risk bearing ACO programs have 2017 as the actual base year. Uh, meaning the way that the revenues were earned under our Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial programs in calendar year 2017 for us, our programs are calendar years, will be the relevant anchor base period for the next five years. Uh, and as we measure things like how should those be adjusted and if there's changes in market share, how do we incorporate those against the 2017 base, uh, I'm going to be living in that world. Uh, and I do worry that if the, if the Green Mountain Care Board hospital budget guidance relies on a different base year, that it could get us in the position where one care, what we think is a well-designed, rational, acceptable payment to hospitals, looks like excess net patient service revenue if you have an earlier base year uh, model. So uh, I don't know how, how uh, you know, what, what's really under that rock for you. Certainly there could be ways to protect hospitals that might be negatively impacted from, uh, from a, a rebasing, but certainly thinking about the fact that the way I will be setting the payment rates to hospitals uh, through OneCare's uh, governance uh, and proposing it to them is with a 2017 actual base year really being the, the, the guide. Number two, uh, I really do suggest that, that you do a statewide multi-payer, all-payer model math, and I put math in, in quotes, I, I'm not really sure they're necessary. But really, the way we think about, we're thinking about our budget next year when you know we appear before you later this year. 
will be to start with that 3.5% factor and again saying, you know, let's start in the first few years of all payer model with that 3.5% and see does that drive the affordability and provide value to payers and, and uh, uh, employers, uh, but also uh, give us enough money to self-invest in this reform that we're doing on our own as the delivery system. Uh, and so really it's no more complex than if you start with you want the whole state of Vermont to grow at 3.5%. Under all payer model, the way it works is Medicare's factor is a defined federally published number that we should know in April. Um, and so we'll know what that is gonna be minus it's 0.2% required by all payer model. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid uh, should be consistent with the state budget uh, and you know discussions that you might wanna have with uh, uh, the administration and the legislatures, they finalize uh, the state budget in terms of what might be the growth rate for delivery of services, funding the delivery of, of medical services to Medicaid beneficiaries. That likely is going to be below 3.5 uh, and probably uh, you know closer to zero than 3.5. Uh, and then solve for what the commercial number ought to be if we are gonna be compliant with our federal uh, all-payer model obligations at 3.5% and use that as a big anchor uh, and see what that number is. Now, over time, obviously, we all want that to be as affordable of a growth rate as possible. I think even in this first cycle, that will generate a number that's fairly affordable uh, uh, for your math. But that's, that's what I would suggest, is to really think about the world in that way, because that's the way OneCare's budget's gonna propose uh, uh, later this year. Number three, and this one might be surprising to you, is I, I believe you should employ a single then hospital subset of that 3.5% math, a single allowed net patient service revenue growth figure uh, for hospitals in fiscal year 2019. Uh, I know the idea has at least been in the public dialogue in terms of, well, should we allow a higher growth rate for the ACO uh, lives uh, and revenues than outside under really pretty logical thinking that we want more providers to be in the ACO and see it as their best path. Uh, that's where the investments are. And for those revenues that remain in a fee-for-service system, we all know how those can actually burn hot. Uh, however, there's one real basic thing that, that really from an ACO perspective I, I, I have trouble with is that makes us the high cost alternative when we're supposed to be the ones delivering the value, right? And so I think in these early years, it's better to have a single growth rate across the hospitals that is designed to make sure that they will stay at the table, that they have the resources to self-invest through the OneCare model in that subset that is uh, OneCare Lives, uh, where we really are making a big investment. So in my mind, I think it's better to spread that across the whole book of business and avoid this issue of payers uh, and employers saying, well, geez, I'd rather take the low fee-for-service rates on the fee-for-service and take my chances uh, in a fee-for-service because at the top, the one care model uh, is more expensive. Uh, and so that's the reason I think, especially for this year, it's the right thing to do. We've had unbelievably great hospital participation uh, in ACOs uh, over the years. We have unbelievable participation this year. I think all the hospitals are poised to, to really, really take this seriously and want to do the model. So uh, I would say my advice is let's give one more cycle of a single NPSR growth, not try to punish or incent uh, hospitals to be in or out. Uh, and maybe next year we got need to talk about whether there's two pathways if there are hospitals that have decided that they do want to go a pathway different than, than all payer model. Uh, and then finally, my final final uh, recommendation is allow hospital commercial NPSR in their budget to be consistent and the related rate structures to be consistent with that APM 3.5% uh, and what you come up with with the allowed NPSR uh, growth factor. Uh, it really you know gets you know fairly deep into detail, but having the actual underlying rate structure not be supportive of and aligned with the PM per person per month population payment in these early years creates a lot of noise and may even jeopardize uh, a, a contract impasse between OneCare and Blue Cross if their actuaries say the fee-for-service rates don't support the PMPM PM that Todd's asking for under the all-payer model math. If that gulf is wide enough, it may even get us in a little bit of trouble with the Affordable Care Act and some of its parameters and, and actuarial values and how would Blue Cross and MVP even think about setting their, their rates. It, it, it just creates a lot of noise uh, and challenge uh, in that uh, 
uh, in that way. So those, those are my four areas of advice. I do have an appendix uh, in here with, uh, you know, uh, bullet points of, of the highlights. I, uh, you know, there's a few more I didn't talk about during my verbal remarks here, but I want to keep it brief and see where you want to dive a little bit deeper, if, if anywhere. Thank you, Tyler. Any questions from the board? I have more of a comment than a question, um, if that's okay. It is. All right. Um, thank you, Todd, for your thoughts. I appreciate it. And um, I, just for myself, as one of the people up here who's been talking about having a differential growth rate, uh, if that is too soon, I'm happy to back off that because I think that we we do want to ensure that people uh, providers have. Uh, appropriately aligned financial incentives and and certainly I can see the risk of moving too aggressively in that direction uh, but I, I do think it's important for the provider community to know to be on notice that this is an area that we will want to explore in the future potentially and understand the appropriate incentives and disincentives uh, to ensure we're meeting our obligations under the API Thank you, and I, and I would agree with that. And uh, you know, when I worry about trying to get to the scale targets and, and increase the scale in this model, uh, you know, I worry more about how we're going to really offer value to the self-funded employers, which is a big block that we'll need to to see this well. And so, uh, you know, balancing again that making it attractive to providers and attractive to the payers and 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 employers uh, uh, is going to be a tough balance, and, and that's the reason why. I, I think that this is probably the right right way to think about it right now. Thank you. Um, Todd, can you go to page seven your appendix? Of course. <coughs> uh, can you put it up there too? Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> question on the last bullet and if this was always explicitly stated I guess in how you presented in the past that really the commercial is the variable that's going to make the 3.5 because um, when I when I thought about this you know over the five-year period we needed to average 3.5 and there could be years potentially where Medicare and Medicaid were going to be higher but you know to the extent that they're lower um, were we always going to just force commercial to then bring it to 3.5? Because I can see then why that could create an issue, you know, within the hospital area if if that if they need to be aligned. But I didn't completely understand that that's the way it was going to work. So if we have a 1.8 for, I guess Medicare, 2.8 for Medicaid, or vice versa, and then commercial has to just be whatever to force the 3.5. And I'm not sure that was really the best way to do it, but. Yeah, and so, and so, you know, having lived through the whole development of this all-payer model, I will tell you that, that the way I've portrayed this is, is largely the perception of the delivery system of the deal that we made, is if we're gonna set course for 3.5%, which on a five-year basis would be an unprecedented Feet. It would. I, I don't think there's ever been a state in the union since the Medicare Act that for five straight years grew at an average of 3.5 percent, right? And so the idea was this 3.5 percent was discussed really heavily with the federal government, and the federal government was actually one of the ones saying, "Don't go below that because we worry about access to, especially acute care services uh, in some of the rural communities and in Vermont for Medicare and Medicaid." beneficiaries and so the idea was this is what it would take to offer value but not ruin the delivery system so I think there was general consensus that this was a good number to shoot for that did represent a much lower and multi-year commitment than history would say would naturally happen and so I think there was a perception uh, that the idea would be that this would be how it would work we try to get to 3.5 percent uh, uh, every year. Now, obviously, it's easier to do in the ACO risk models than it is to predict where you're going to end up in a fee-for-service environment, uh, and that may be a reason why you might want to, you know, have the hospital guidance be a, a tad below 3.5 percent to offer some leg up, uh, not only to the ACO but to the to the non-ACO business. But, you know, I got to be re honest. One of my reactions to all-payer model was it does sort of codify the cost shift in a, in a real structured way. 
Uh, and one of the big things the state negotiated to get was there's no cap on the Medicare growth rate. So if the Medicare growth rates go to 5%, and we got to take that 0.2% and it's a 4.8% factor, don't you want the delivery system to guarantee all of that would go to the commercial rate relief? So really a lot of the things you think about in your hospital net patient service revenue guidance is baked into this, right? And so you've got you know, protection on the other side too that if, if Medicare and Medicaid are higher, that the commercial would automatically be lower. So that is part of the way at least I've always thought about it and having been at a lot of the meetings, the way that I thought that, that the original principles of all pair model and tests anticipated it would work. And I just wonder whether <coughs> in that Medicaid and Medicare, the expectation was that there were going to be more years where maybe it was going to be four and a half or five versus a year right now that we're looking at where they're both under the 3.5 potentially because, you know, I worry more about the, because we need to average 3.5, you know, would this have been an opportunity this year? I understand it's early on but to have a number that would have been below 3.5, and then if two or three years down the road, Medicaid and Medicare were higher, you know, and even if commercial pressure was still higher, and we had a four or four and a half that year, it would be okay, because we're, we would have averaged. I, I just feel like we're locking ourselves in to commit to the 3.5 in years where potentially it could have been lower, and in the future, we don't know what that's gonna be, and you could get that pressure on the other factors of being higher and then it forces a commercial load quite low, so. Yeah, I mean, I can only tell you from the ACO perspective, I do not, you know, anticipate, you know, in any time soon coming into you with an ask that's higher than what, for our payer mix, is consistent with a statewide 3.5% growth rate, right? I think the providers have said, I mean, part of this is if the natural rate of growth is 4.5, we've agreed to live on 3.5. We've agreed to eat that extra percentage. That, that's what the provider community feels is the deal that we've made. And then just um, to go back to Riley's point in, on um, one number, you know, are you coming in saying you think that one number needs to be 3.5 or you're saying there can be a little bit lower than that? Um, it's a loaded question, but I mean, you know, you're saying one number versus having us break it out in two. And, you know, we're, that looks like where we're going is to have one number. Um, in order to support what you're saying, does that number have to be 3.5? I would be very comfortable with 3.5, knowing all the investments uh, that the hospitals are making and, and the bearing of risk. Uh, however, you got to realize the one care budget, if you recall, uh, really, once we finally have in these risk-bearing uh, ACO models some ability to think about the pie of spending, we are taking from the hospital slice where, where what would actuarially have been predicted for hospital spending and putting it in primary care, uh, uh, including community-based primary care outside of the hospital uh, and community-based programs and funding other things. Uh, and so, you know, you know, within our model, we already have set the precedent at one care of, yeah, hospitals might not grow at the full 3.5 because we need that extra revenue uh, to, to invest. So, you know, in that as we scale lives to have that investment there, I'd be most comfortable with 3.5% guidance. Uh, I think, you know, somewhat lower, knowing that I'm keeping some of that revenue off the top and maybe the hospitals can budget the lower net patient service revenue from one care. There may be a meeting of the models in a very elegant way, uh, you know, below 3.5. Um, percent as your guidance to them. Great, thanks. Todd, a recent uh, national study showed that um, across the U.S., hospital spending is about a third of um, total healthcare spending. Um, all indications from all the data that we have is that Vermont is significantly higher. What are you using as your number for a percentage of hospital spend? So if you really, so in my world, my contracts have a very defined set of services that in Medicare, it's, it's generally referred to as part A and part B. So it's, you know, hospitals, doctors, uh, home health, uh, medical type services, uh, and a few other services uh, in that uh, inpatient and outpatient hospital. In that type of spend, the hospital for inpatient and outpatient spending is about two thirds of the spend. So I think what you might have seen, Kevin, is just the inpatient hospital portion uh, of, of the spend. Uh, 
Uh, now, in terms of, of you know, benchmarking and, and thinking about where we are on hospital spend, I, I know for Medicare, we're nationally very low. Uh, it's really hard to find good data on where we are from a you know, statewide all-payer model system. Um, I, I would say the strength of, of Vermont's hospital system uh, is one of the bedrocks that made us ready to take on this 3.5% challenge um, and, and you know, the reason why we have such good hospital participation. I don't know if I answered your question or if you even had a question, but. No, I think the point I was just trying to make is that it's not all hospitals. There's not a direct correlation to hospital versus total spend. Yeah, I think that that's, that's correct. And, you know, one of the reasons why I really for years have been telling the hospitals get ready for a fixed payment model for your spend is that gives me a big leg up on, you know, managing the risk, but there's still hundreds of millions of dollars outside of the hospital system that we need to pay attention to and sort of driving that appreciation on how do we allocate that and think about that and, and control that because it's really the total cost of care that really is the most direct driver of affordability because uh, you got to pay for the total cost of care if you're going to cover somebody with your Medicare, Medicaid, uh, or Blue Cross. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? <clears throat> so I guess, Todd, um, because that's the way it says it on the agenda, I'll invite Mike up and have him do his presentation, and then we'll do the public comment and uh, questions for both of you at the same time. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay. Great. Thank you. Mike. Good morning. Good morning. I think my first response to Todd is um, if we're doing a play, I really don't want to play me. <laughs> Who would you like to be? Yeah. I, I, I was starting to go there. I, we'll have to draw straws, I think. But we should definitely switch it up. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to come speak to you a little bit uh, about the, uh, the budget uh, guidance, hospital budget guidance, and about this process. Um, this is also my first time in this room uh, since you moved here. And um, it does remind me a little bit of, of high school. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, the problem is staying awake. <laughs> um, so I, I think the first point I, I really want to make sure I, I make uh, clearly is an appreciation for uh, a different approach that, uh, that we experienced this year uh, with regard to budget guidance. Uh, the board has approached us and has worked with us in a, in a different way that I think is uh, substantially better. It will uh, lead to uh, our uh, healthcare advocates office ability to um, uh, get questions in a, a much more timely fashion and an ability to um, uh, focus our comments uh, during, uh, during the hearings in, a, in, a, in, in more of a clarification and responding to presentations and um, uh, fashion rather than trying to get questions uh, answers to questions that we hadn't been able to, to get uh, articulated yet. So I appreciate that and, and think uh, and hope that it's a model that we can build on for the other regulatory functions. Um, generally, uh, um, the Healthcare Advocates Office agrees um, um, with the concept of, of uniformity in uh, between the different regulatory functions. and and being able to do an apples to apples comparison. Um, um, the challenge is that, uh, that uh, each of the, the uh, regulated entities are not the same and don't serve exactly the same populations and, um, and different populations are uh, uh, experienced different. <coughs> the conversation that was just had about whether 3.5 across the whole system uh, makes sense and, and how different populations from different payers uh, uh, would experience that um, is interesting to us. And so I, I ultimately believe that there is a balancing act that the board has to apply here um, of how to have some uniformity in its approach while also recognizing that there uh, may often be needs for a more granular approach to understand how different populations um, are affected. 
I, I did find myself, as I was sitting uh, here listening this morning, uh, with the typical question from the healthcare advocate's office, uh, how would a consumer experience this? Um, and I, I, um, I don't have a real clear answer to that question, but it's always the question that comes to us as I think about uh, the calls that come into our office. And um, <coughs> generally, I, I think the, you know, the answer is, does fold back on uh, people's ability to get the care they need uh, because of the cost. Um, so, um, um, the one other, uh, I, we generally support uh, the board continuing to put some real downward pressure on the growth. Uh, we um, uh, ha haven't heard any discussion yet today about the question of rebasing. Uh, the Healthcare Advocates Office has been clear in our comments that, uh, that we believe that if there is a need to rebase, that it happen uh, as part of the regular budget process, uh, not separately. Um, and, uh, and I'll, again, I'll approach that question from, you know, how, how will people uh, uh, read the decisions that the board makes? Um, uh, the public and the regulated entities, uh, uh, will they see the board's action as a, um, uh, you know, the board made a decision, it's gonna hold to that decision? Um, or will, uh, will the public or the uh, regulated, regulated entities uh, see um, some concept of uh, the goalposts being moved. I think that's really important, um, and it's important for the board's uh, future. Uh, so, uh, those are generally my comments, and um, happy to receive to respond to any questions. Or... So, board of questions or comments, Robin? Uh, I actually have a reaction to what you just said about. Um, of how people react to what we decide. We are an independent board for a reason, which mm -hmm. is to take the politics out of it and to focus on the facts and the data. So uh, I don't think that you were suggesting otherwise, but just for myself, I had a strong reaction to it, so I'm yeah. going to say it out loud, which is yeah. I think you know, the, the reason why we were appointed and the reason why we could be removed for cause and not at the whim of politics is so that we can be a little bit insulated from those dynamics and be able to make hard decisions in a data-driven way, so. I, I appreciate that, and I don't disagree with it. Uh, yeah, no, I would just comment on, um, on the discussion on rebasing and the timing of that. And I think it's, it's you know, perspective on, is it more of a response to actuals and, and we do have a, a point in time to review actuals and then make decisions off of that versus waiting until a budget time to make that change and and what does that reaction time then give a hospital if we're going to rebase them so you know in, in i know one of your comments was one year doesn't make a trend um you know i think it, it's one of the written feedback that you guys did like not necessarily doing something off of one year and in particular, the you know hospital that we had talked about rebasing UVM has had a three-year trend of exceeding the number um, significantly, 28 million, 25 million, 38, 35 million over the past three years. So I would say that was taken into a, a, you know as a factor in determining whether we would do something, and you know should we do it? Yeah, the timing is: do we do it in response to the actuals and re and regulator regulating? If there was an excess regulating something on that excess and then making a change. So I, I think it's really more of a timing and and being able to give responsiveness to hospitals um, rather than at budget time all of a sudden then saying, hey, we're changing the, the name, you know, the game here and we're rebasing you. So, you know, I appreciate your you know comments, but I think it's also it's a matter of perspective on when does that timing. Uh, thank you. I, I, I absolutely support the board's ability to rethink and uh, uh, any question that uh, it's answered in the past. Uh, of course, you have to look at the data that's before you and respond to it. Uh, at the same time, um, a, a little bit of as a, a, a feedback loop, you know, um, how we do these things do matter. And um, the message that 
you are an independent board, but you have an impact on the world. And the message that's sent out to the, um, I'll focus now on the regulated community, I think is important. Um, so uh, there is something about the hospital budget process that uh, includes uh, you know, a, a public and transparent process that we think is important. And, um, um, and so at the same time, I'm, I'm not gonna disagree with one bit your, your ability and right to rethink uh, a decision that you've made in, in a timely fashion given the, the data that's in front of you. Okay, so at this time I'll welcome the public to uh, offer any comments or questions to either Mike or Todd. Um, just stand up and state your name and address your question through me. Mark. I just have one question I think for Todd. I know we're talking about the growth rates of 3.5%. But can you put that in comparison to the part, to the risk the participants are taking for you know consuming that fixed payment model? Should there be a volume increase? Because I know we're focusing a lot on percents today, but it would be good to put the dollar amount of risk in perspective of the total as a percentage. Because I just don't want us to lose that 3.5 percent isn't guaranteed. There's a risk component that all of the participants are taking. And that's an important message that I think that should not get lost today. That 3.5% is guaranteed under the best case scenario in a state where we know our population is aging. And particularly that's gonna get Medicare the hardest. And you know, Medicare is one of the biggest participants um, in the 2018 model. Well, I mean, as we sit here right today for 2018, let alone 2019, when we uh, will expand scale, at, at least at some level, uh, hospitals are really taking two levels of risk to make the 3.5% trend rate real. One is they're accepting fixed prospective monthly payments to cover any services that they provide, inpatient, outpatient, specialty physician, primary care, fixed prospective payments monthly to cover all services to the attributed lives of, of one care. Um, to the degree that more services are demanding, they are not going to get more money for one care's lives in delivering those services. So. You know, I urge you to think about this may be the beginning of an era where that is going to be more the discipline than the hospital budget uh, enforcement uh, model. Um, you know, and so said another way, uh, you know, hospitals may need to deliver more services into a smaller revenue pie for their own uh, organization, effectively diluting what would be the equivalent fee for service value. So it basically is a forced rate reduction implemented a different way, at least within the model. Now, the thing that I think is really underappreciated is on top of that, somebody's got to bear the total cost of care risk for the whole system, as Chair Mullen uh, said, uh, includes a whole lot more spending. But having the hospitals locked in is helpful, but that doesn't relieve the ACO of having its full level of risk on the total cost of care that could be driven by Hospitals not in the system, hospitals in Boston, hospitals in New York City, you know, uh, uh, you know fee-for-service players in Vermont that have not agreed to be part of OneCare. Uh, all of that risk is also being borne by the hospitals. And as we sit here right now, the worst case scenario, probably pretty unlikely, would be at this time next year, I'm preparing them to write combined across 10 hospitals, checks to OneCare to send to Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross of $23 million. Okay, I mean, you know, this is serious levels of risk, and in both levels of risk are there. Hospitals have taken both those. One, the fixed revenue risk for their own services, and two, being the risk-bearing entities on behalf of the whole system, um, uh, up to the tune of $23 million this year, and likely will be north of $30 million for calendar year 2019, you know, if we get to the, to the higher ends of our, of our hope for scale growth make a comment on the age issue because uh, I think one thing that's maybe underappreciated is we do have the ability to age adjust the Medicare uh, component of the all care model um, and last year we did look at that and it was not advantageous to do so so I think it's just important to recognize that that's a factor that we can adjust for if it if it's helpful 
Okay, other questions or comments from the public? Jeff. Thank you. I, I wasn't sure. That's quite an entrance. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, perfectly timed, right? So I wasn't sure if there was going to be a public comment period uh, preceding the vote and following Pat, um, but just wanted to make a couple points um, at, at this time. Um, it, we have sent, as you know, a few letters from Boz reflecting our position on hospital budget guidance. Um, one might consider it the NPSR mini-series, so we could figure out who, who would act in that one. Um, but as you know, throughout those communications, we encouraged a 3.4% target. And we did that for several reasons. Some of them was our own analysis of the inflationary and wage pressures our hospitals face. Some of it was around the investments and contributions that they're making, and we outlined all of that to you. Um, I'm also trying to channel a little bit Jill Barry Bowen, who can't be here today, but also outlined all of that to you. And in addition to that, or complementing it, is what you just heard from Todd Moore, that the 3.5% target in the all-payer model was carefully and meticulously negotiated with the federal government and itself was considered and still is a very aggressive um, and promising target for healthcare growth that, that, as Todd mentioned, is almost impossible to parallel elsewhere in the nation, certainly on the trend that that we're trying to produce. So, so for those reasons, we agree that, that the three point, we stand by the 3.4% number being the right one. Um, and as Todd also pointed out, and we have too throughout this process, is that hospitals are in fact bearing the risk. They are the ones taking on the transformation costs. They are the ones continuing to invest and move forward with a model that is uncertain but also promising to them and doing it in a way again that is not happening elsewhere in the country as we continue to build on the, the great success we've had taking 600 million dollars in costs out of the system with the current path that we're on so i just want to reiterate before a vote takes place that we stand by the 3.4 percent for all the reasons we've outlined and that we hope you'll thoughtfully continue to give room to hospitals to make these investments to invest in their communities in the way that they're expected to, and those expectations do not diminish or go away, regardless of what role they're playing in health reform and elsewhere. Um, and that, that you acknowledge the contribution that they're making, the risk they're taking, um, and the fact that we are making really substantial and respectable progress here. And as we said in our first communication to the board and our last, we believe that it's better to move incrementally and wisely than too far too fast and thereby risking the good work we've done and the potential we have to do more. So um, thank you for hearing those comments and for considering our input throughout the process. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Is there anyone else in the public who wishes to comment or have a question at this time? <coughs> Seeing none, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very well. Chad, if you could uh, come forward. So what I'd like to do today is just very quickly describe the activity that's occurred to date around the fiscal year 19 hospital budget guidance and then um, provide some staff recommendations for the board to discuss and potentially decide on first of all an NPR target for the fiscal year 2019 guidance and that really has three components. The first is the NPR rate. The second is the revenue that would be subject to the NPR target and we've heard a bit about that today. And then also the allowance for healthcare reform investments if any. And then um, finally, uh, some material to consider, some recommendations to consider for discussion and potential decision on whether to rebase 
the fiscal year 2018 budgets for those hospitals that had a greater than 2% variance between their 17 actuals and their 17 approved budgets. And that rebasing would really be used as the basis for the fiscal year 2019 calculations. So activity to date, um, the draft budget guidance has been released. The latest version um, was released yesterday. We did get quite a bit of uh, public feedback and so comments were considered, some, some changes were made um, and you have that latest um, budget guidance. Second, we um, did some analysis between the 17 actuals and budget, and that is what led to discussion on rebasing. Third, we considered this idea of applying different NPR targets to the fixed prospective payment revenue from the ACO and to the fee-for-service revenue. Again, we've heard um, some discussion on that and gotten feedback on that as well. And then finally, um, there's been some preliminary discussion on the NPR target, and it does include an allowance for healthcare reform investments. Before I um, get into the um, financial discussion, board member Holmes had asked that um, we highlight that um, for the first time in the draft budget guidance, we provided some information on quality measure results and specifically results around as many of the 20 quality measures that are in Vermont's all-payer model agreement with the federal government as we could obtain data for. I want to um, acknowledge my colleague Michelle Lawrence who helped to compile this information. And we used a variety of sources. We looked at um, blueprint community health profiles to get some of the information and we used health department data for other information. And I, I want to note that the way we present these results is not by high hospital. It's um, either by health service area or hospital service area, as you see here, or in some of the other metrics, um, it's by county. But the idea was to give the hospitals some information about how we're performing statewide on these metrics and how um, each area, each region is performing so that we can hear their reaction to that during the hospital budget process. And it's really part of our ongoing effort to link the hospital budget process with the all-payer model, to link finances with quality, because after all, um, improving quality of care and providing needed care to Vermonters is what this is all about. So back um, to the issues at hand today. Um, the first uh, decision point and the staff recommendation that I present to you is what should the NPR target be? And the staff recommendation, which has been tweaked slightly from last week, is to apply a single net patient revenue target of 2.8% to all revenue and an additional allowance of up to 0.4% for healthcare reform investments. Last week we had shown 2.75 and 0.45. Uh, upon further thought, um, the 2.8% actually um, matches the increase in actuals um, from 16 to 17. And the, allowing the 0.4% to remain constant from last year's healthcare reform investment rate allows some consistency and gives those hospitals who are seeking to increase their healthcare reform investments to be able to do so at a slightly lower pace. So that's, that's the recommendation on the NPR target. I would ask um, from a process point of view, do you want me to continue with the recommendations around rebasing and then discuss all of it together or would you like to stop here? So in my letter in mind, I like it when things are linear. So if we could just have a discussion on the NPR first, I think it would be helpful. I can make a motion. Sure. Start conversation. Um, okay, 
So I would move that we accept the staff recommendation for a single NPR target of 2.8% with all uh, patient revenue included in that with additional allowance of 0.4% for health reform investments that are aligned with um, the transition to value-based purchasing, increased access to primary care, reduced deaths from suicide drug overdose, and or reduced prevalence of chronic disease. So those are the buckets from the all-payer model. So putting some boundaries around with that 0.4% health care reform investment. I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there a second? Second. Is there a second? Um, we'll open it up for discussion. By the board and, and just in, in case there is a member of the public that wishes to uh, make a comment on this I will open it up to the public afterwards so um, board discussion Tom just a clarification I heard uh, <coughs> just the beginning of the motion which was the 2.8 percent point oh four percent but the narrative after that I uh, didn't if you were speaking sure. that correct today. okay so it was a, so the point four percent I basically just took from our the written budget guidance uh, the boundaries around what we would expect that 0.4% to be. So it was specifically the language in there was uh, the 0.4% would be used for transition to value-based purchasing and or increasing access to primary care, uh, reducing deaths from suicide and drug overdose, and or reducing prevalence through chronic disease. Thank so, you. Yeah. So it's an alignment with It's on page us. nine of the, of the hospital budget guidance. So, <clears throat> Is there any other uh, questions from the board member before I open it up to the public? Seeing none, is there anyone from the public who wishes to make a comment or question at this point in time? Seeing none, <clears throat> if there's no further discussion, um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Let the record note it was a unanimous decision of the board. Okay, Pat. Okay. Um, so the second uh, potential decision point, again, is rebasing those hospitals um, with a greater than 2% variance between their fiscal year approved budgets and actuals. Um, we have, to, the staff has two recommendations here and then an item for discussion. The first recommendation would be to rebase the University of Vermont Medical Center and Porter Medical Center for the purposes of their fiscal year 19 calculations. And you may recall from last week that the, that the calculation is that we would use their fiscal year 17 actuals as the base, and then we would apply the system-wide um, fiscal year 18 targets to update that base. So the target um, for fiscal year 18 is 3% um, as a base and then up to 0.4% for healthcare reform investments. So if um, the hospitals use the 0.4% uh, allowance, then they would um, see their budget amount rebased by 3.4%. The second recommendation is that hospitals with a variance of 2% or less between fiscal year 17 approved budgets and actuals should not be rebased. So you'll recall that we talked about a 0.5% um, factor and 2% and the board um, decided to focus on those hospitals with a greater than 2% uh, variance between their budgets and actuals. So those hospitals that fell below that would not be rebased if you accepted this recommendation. And then the discussion point is really around um, the other four hospitals who had a variance of um, greater than 2% between their fiscal year 17 approved budgets and actuals. And they were below. Those hospitals are Gifford Medical Center, Grace Cottage Hospital, North Country Hospital, and Springfield Hospital. And um, the, the discussion point here is um, does the board think that during their fiscal year 19 budget submissions and subsequent presentations, does it make sense for those hospitals to um, look at their actuals, look at where their 18 um, actuals are trending according to their 
um, 18 budgets, and then look at either justifying why they should base their 19 budgets on their fiscal year 18 um, budgets or projected revenues, or should they propose a rebased budget? And I, I just outlined those points a little bit more on this slide. Um, but the idea is that when they submit their budgets and come in, and this really would apply to all hospitals, including if, if you opt to rebase UVMMC and Porter, we would really like to see during the submissions and the presentations that all of those hospitals who had that, you know, decent size variance between their 17 approved budgets and actuals, we'd like them to make sure that they um, are, are um, sharing with us what's the degree to which their 18 actuals are trending to either their approved budget or if they've been rebased to their rebased budget. Um, what's their justification for basing their 19 budget on their 18 approved budget if they decide to do so, or alternatively um, propose a rebased budget. And if their actuals um, continue to show a variance, um, we'll know a lot more when the hospitals come in to present in August. But if they continue to show um, a variance of greater than 2% as the year progresses, they should anticipate that there'll be discussion on mechanisms to address the variance. And then the, the last bullet here really outlines a point that we made last week, and that's that if a hospital stands by its fiscal year 18 budget, when their 19 budget is approved, if they say, no, you know, this is the right basis, um, we need to base it on the fiscal year 18 budget. And then it turns out that it's fiscal year 18 actuals vary by at least 2%. Um, it, it, there is a, a possibility that the board could decide to formally revise their 19 budget. So I'll stop there. Um, that um, those really do uh, consist of the staff's recommendations and potential decision points on the basis. Thank you, Pat. Are there any questions for Pat from the board? Is there anyone from the public who wishes to make a, a comment or a question? If so, address it through me. Okay, is there a board member who would like to make a motion? I'm happy to make a motion. Um, speak loudly. I will speak loudly and I will speak into the microphone out this way. Uh, I guess I would just preface this by saying that I, I think that the work that we've been doing and thinking about rebasing, I'm really um, excited about moving away from this idea of budget to budget and having baked in fictitious budgets and actually taking into account the reality that's on the ground for those hospitals that are up and those hospitals that are down, and really looking at actuals in our budget process a little bit more thoroughly. So um, with that said, I think what the motion I was going to make, I crafted this earlier this morning, um, I move that we rebase UVM and Porter Medical Center for fiscal year 19 budget submission, as outlined in the staff presentation, and ask that the other hospitals with a greater than 2% variance between fiscal year 17 actuals and budget to submit fiscal year 19 budgets more closely aligned with their fiscal year actual and fiscal year 18 projected actuals. So in other words, we rebase UVM and Porter Hospital, and those hospitals that have exceeded the 2%, what we're asking them to do is really take a look at their fiscal year 17 actuals, look at their fiscal year 18 where they're performing, and submit to us a budget for fiscal year 19 that more accurately reflects where they think they're going to be fiscal year 19, based on their actuals. Is there a second? I'll second. Hey, is there discussion from the board? Uh, discussion. Um, okay, I just want to make a couple points. One, on the, the rebase of um, UVM and Porter. Um, you know, one way to look at this is to separate that rebase to when we actually complete um, what we are going to be recommending to regulate for um, UVM in particular. 
Um, so I just want to at least put the caveat out there that there is a possibility their NPR could be impacted uh, for 2019 if in those final recommendations there's some adjustment to their rates for insurance. Um, and we know there are some other things floating around we may discuss that wouldn't necessarily impact rate, but you know, I was one looking at this saying we should wait to formally do the rebase until we completely wrap up the 2017 process and determine if there's an impact on their NPR for that. So, you know, I'm willing to allow it to go through if we kind of place that out there that there is potentially um, some impact that could be coming down the road on the NPR should we decide to, to regulate the, by the insurance rates. Um, so I would just put that out there. And um, the second bullet I think is fine. You know, if, if the hospitals were, had a variance of less than 2%, absolutely they should not be rebased. That wasn't the intent. Um, on the third bullet, you know, many of the hospitals came back last week, and I separate these into two buckets. There's the hospitals that were over, and so they were kind of getting something, and the hospitals that were under that we were taking away from. And, you know, they all came in and basically were pitching that they're going to be close to their 18 actuals or things that had happened, the 18 budget, things that had happened that were unique in 17. And so, you know, I'm open to listen to that, but when they come in for their budget time in August. Uh, when they do their presentation, they do it on April data, so it's still pretty early, April or May data. But by August, all of these hospitals that were rebased should have a pretty good read on where they're coming in. And if they're still coming in for the hospitals that were under, underneath, then our intent very well could be that they will be based on where their 2018 actual is coming in, because that's Really, when, when you think about it, we expect people are going to perform to their budget, and if we give a, a rate of, you know, 2.8 percent, on top of that, um, excluding the health care reform investments, then the expectation is they're getting 2.8 percent on on their budget. If they vary quite a bit from that, particularly on this case below it, then the expectation should be they're going to get 2.8 percent on that. When we look at UVM and Porter, you know, we're, we're giving UVM potentially quite, quite a bit of an increase for 2018 on the chance that they're coming in under and they're not hitting that budget and they're coming in only 30 million up, not 39 million up. You know, that should be a factor for consideration. Um, if they're over, that's a different story. But if they're coming in under, you know, we, they should expect that we're going to be looking at that for both Porter and, and UVM. And, addressing where are you coming in for 18. So I just wanted to make those clarifications um, from my point of view. Anything else, Tom? <laughs> this discussion this morning is, uh, uh, is, is difficult in, for me anyhow because uh, in the context of uh, wanting to promote affordability, um, which is, involves cost constraint, um, at the same time, wanting the ACO to be successful. Um, at the same time, not having um, real-time, near real-time data to make a decision on. I mean, we're talking about NPR, but in the end, it's not <coughs> NPR that is the basis for determining the success of the, um, of the all-payer system. It's VCURE's data that will be used, and we don't even have a baseline of, 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 of data established uh, for 2017, the base year. Um, in terms of rebasing um, Porter and UVM, um, I would note that by uh, <coughs> uh, rebasing UVM and Porter based on their 2017 actuals, we're kind of baking in the 4.7% increase of 17 over 16 that UVM experienced, um, and we're baking in the 4.2% uh, increase uh, 2017 over 2016 of quarter. Um, and that may not be problematic in the long run, but it might be because we just haven't seen how these things will roll out over the next two or three years. Um, um, and it's also, I think, uh, problematic that uh, you know we're just using one year over year um, as opposed to the trend line. If we use the trend line for UVM, uh, uh, from 2015, for example, to 2017, 
it would be 4.2 percent, and that would have uh, an effect on their projected NPR, which would have an effect on affordability. Um, so I, uh, uh, um, I, I think I will, uh, you know, would, would rather kind of align myself more with Marines. Let's wait and see. Um, and not redo this in the middle of uh, the 2018 budget process and save this for, uh, to wrap it all up in the 2019 budget process. My, my hope is, is that uh, there will be in UVM's budget, uh, um, you know, they exceeded their NPR by about $38 million, uh, 20 million of that fell uh, uh, through their uh, operating statement to their bottom line, increasing their um, excess uh, revenue over expenses from 63 million, I think, to about 89 million. Um, and we will be having a discussion, I think, I hope, about what to do with that. Um, uh, if anything, uh, that, that extra uh, money revenue that fell to the bottom line. So for me, a, a wait and see approach uh, makes more sense than uh, making a recommendations for change uh, mid year. Um, and in the context of um, really not having a clear visibility of, 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 of the impact of, the, of these decisions and baking in uh, for those hospitals that exceeded their NPR budgets for uh, uh, 2017, kind of you know, baking in uh, those increases. I just want to make one clarifying point. I don't think we're making a mid-year change. I think this is a part of our fiscal year 19 guidance. So we're providing guidance to the hospitals uh, for the basis upon which they should build their fiscal 19 budget. Um, and I do hear Maureen's point about the reality is that, yes, when, when um, hospitals come in in August, we should be looking at where their actuals are compared to what the budget is, and we will look at that. But I think at this point, we're trying to give guidance and to give direction I think the hospitals need to know upon what basis they should be building their budget. And I think what we're trying to say here is build your budget based on the reality that you're experiencing, whether you're up or down. So we're acknowledging the realities that we're seeing, I think, through this process. I, I would just add to my comment, if I could, that you know, all hospitals aren't equal. Um, if you take the you know, UVM network, uh, uh, UVM Medical Center, Porter, and Central Vermont, they are almost 60% of the uh, hospital NPR, and so they have a, these. these uh, their impact uh, is much greater than um, all the other hospitals combined. I just want to clarify, um, Tom, and the comment you made about I'm, I'm not saying we wait on EVM and Porter until the 2019 budget time. Um, I was just saying in the next month, um, I believe we're going to be revisiting, you know, the overage that we experienced, they experienced in 2017, and wrapping it up there. And I, you know, did say I'm willing to say let this go through, with the caveat there's a potential that, you know, one of the options may impact NPR carried through to 2019 if we do anything with rate. Um, the other hospitals um, that were under. Um, I think we have decided um, to look at them when we do the budget time and see where they're trending. Because, you know, I don't think it's fair to pull the rug out under them midway through the budget. They're all just trying to hit their budget numbers and midway through, it's difficult to try to change that course. But do want them to be on notice that, you know, they were under significantly in 2017. If that continues in 2018, that's what their budget should be based on, is that trend. Um, but certainly during the course of the year, we don't want to tell them to stop doing anything and adjust their budget midstream if they're hitting it. But if they're not and they continue to fall short, that will be a factor. So I just want to uh, follow up on that. that uh, I want to make it clear, and I think that uh, uh, we have some great leadership in our hospitals, and I don't think anybody would, would do this, but by saying um, that we're looking at what your actual budget in the current year ends up being, uh, that should not be taken as, as a, a reason to try to encourage uh, more tests or procedures or anything else, and I don't think that would occur, but uh, I think that Hospitals are, are 
willing partners in trying to bend the cost curve in Vermont and I get the point of the 2017 actual enforcement versus uh, budget guidance discussion but the reality is that the two are very much interlinked because um, what we will be giving for guidance is based on what we see historically. And I think if we make the decision today, we actually are putting ourselves in a better position in the next couple of weeks or longer, but no longer than a month, uh, of figuring out what the uh, enforcement actions actually are of 2017. So to me, it's not it's not a bad thing to, to make this decision now and move forward. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Can I, can I just raise something briefly, um, just a technical point? I know we've been talking about the 2% variance, I, and in the guidance it is still what it was last year. It says may look at hospitals with the 5%, and I just wanted to clarify if the board is saying for 2019 it's the 2%. It, that should maybe be um, updated in the No, I think we're guides. still going to look at it if it's uh, more than a So just still leave percent. it. It is um, permissive, but we kind of moved it yeah. a little bit. Okay. Okay, if not, I'll call the question. Um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Let the record show it was a 4-1 vote. Pat, I just want to, uh, on behalf of the board, um, thank you. Um, it's uh, it was exciting to see you step up and uh, move into the position, and uh, really moved into it at a challenging time as there are so many decision points. And um, I just want to thank you for the long hours you put in. And I know you have a great team, and they're happy to, to uh, have you as their leader. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for your support. Is there any old business to come before the board? What's that? We did earlier. We opened up more people. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. So we moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed?